Oh, Agent Starling, you think you can dissect me with this blunt little tool? No. I, I thought that your knowledge... You're so ambitious, aren't you? Do you know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. This is Mongolia Mindset, and today we're going to be typing Anthony Hopkins. Uh, Shelly said we got to get him on, on, uh, on the channel. So we're going to type him uh, today. Um... We're going to go check and see what the monkeys over at Personality Database has them as. You guys know we use Linda Bear's temperament and interaction styles. Combined with cognitive function to find people's personality type. Uh, let's see what the monkeys got. So the monkeys got Anthony Hopkins as an ISFJ. Let's go check the chart here. <clears throat> the chiping chart. So ISFJs are informative. They're responding. They're outcome focused. Um, they're systematic. They're concrete. They're T-I-F-E. And they're S-I-N-E. Okay. Um, if he meets those metrics, we will call him an ISFJ. If he does not, we won't call him that. Um, but uh, comment below what you think his actual type is. Um, we're going to get into this interview. Um, and I'm, I want to bet probably like 85%, probably 90% that uh, the character he plays is probably the same personality type. Okay, um, we have the metrics here. We have the metrics here. Um, we have initiated, respond, abstract, concrete, systematic interest. You guys see it. Um, once we get five points for something, then we'll go ahead and knock it off and, and say that uh, that's part of his personality type, okay? Um, and I'll explain it as we go, okay? And uh, we are trying to dial up the interviews um, going on. Uh, we got my friend Mark this Saturday, plastic surgeon. Um, we have my friend um, Jerome also Saturday. Uh, we got we getting CJ in here, and we also getting my friend who's a pathologist in here, Caitlin. So we'll try to rail up these interviews and get y'all some great uh, content. We'll see. Um, a lot of people think the doctors are SJs. We're gonna see. Um, our plastic surgeons different. Our pathologists different. We're gonna see. We're gonna try to get these numbers. I'm working on trying to get my other friend who's an orthopedic surgeon um, to get on there. So that'd be dope. Uh, I'm working on getting my friend who's a uh, radiologist as well on there. So we're going to keep going. We're going to try to dial up these interviews. And we are still doing the free typing sessions with us. Um, all you have to do is join our uh, Facebook group or Discord and message our moderator, Cody, and we'll get back to you. Um, it's going to be a little bit tougher, so you got you to gotta get in there now because we are starting to rail up the interviews um, to get you guys more quality. But what do you think Anthony Hopkins type is? Please comment below what you think it is, and then let's see if it's the same career was launched and England celebrated its next great actor. But he was not to remain exclusively on the British stage. Across the Atlantic, he took on Broadway and Hollywood too. From the horrifying Dr. Hannibal Lecter in Sounds of the Lamb to the graciously reserved Stevens in Remains of the Day, Sir Anthony infuses every role with a fiery intelligence. He possesses a rare combination of talents, placing him in a class of most honored actors, and we're pleased to have him here for this conversation. Welcome, Thank Sir you. Anthony. Yes. Uh, this was what last year was it? Would you? Were well, yeah, made a, earlier this year. Yes. Yeah, so honored. Big surprise. Yeah. Uh, yes. It, it, it. Actually, I knew about it uh, before the end of last year. Yeah. And you are sworn to secrecy. My wife phoned me up. She said, "You've been offered a knighthood." I said, "What for?" <laughs> she said, "I don't know." But she said, "But they want to know if you'll accept." It. I said, "Yeah, it's a great honor." Yeah. Is this the best time of your life? I mean, remains of the day. Now, Shadowland and and following. Um, Howard's in, and before that, uh, Silence of the Lambs. It's the best it's, time. It is. Yeah. Why? Well, it's all happened again unexpectedly. I mean, I had, a, you know, quite a good career for many years. I've been 30 years as an actor. Came over to America in 74, did Equus here. Right. Uh, and it was a successful production. I went off to Hollywood and did exactly what I wanted to do. All my dreams came true. Did exactly what I wanted to do. All my dreams came true. I'm going to say that's N-I there, and um, S-E and N-I are attached to the same thing there. So we're going to put him down for S-E and N-I. He knows his future. Um, he manifested his future. That's N-I, okay? So with that being said, let's keep going. I did some good films and a few, quite a few bad ones as well, not so good. And uh, about 10 years ago, I... I thought, well, maybe it's time to go home. I went back to England, had a... About 84 so. That's right, and yeah. I started uh, working in the theater again. I did three big plays. Okay, he's going through a progression here. He, he's going through a progression. Um, let's 
go back, play that. Make sure you guys are getting this, man, because I want you guys to be just as good as me. My dreams came true. I did some good films and a few, quite a few bad ones as well, <clears> not so good. And uh, about 10 years ago, I, I thought, well, maybe it's time to go home. I went back to England. Maybe I thought it was time to go home, see? At, uh, to that's, started, four, so. that's right, and I started working in the theatre again. I did three big plays, King Lear and Natalie and Cleopatra, and another play called Pravda by David Eyre. And I started resigning myself to the factory. Resignation sounds rather negative, but I thought, well, maybe I'm just going to be a respectable British stage actor. And, you know, fair enough. And then out of the blue came Silence of the Lambs, and the whole thing started over again. See, progression. I'm hitting for two, two on that. So, I'm a, a little bewildered, but very happy. I'm yeah. very, very happy. I'm having wanna, a lot of fun. I want to talk about all of that, but let me talk about Shadowland, because yeah. it is... Uh, tell me about the two characters. This is a great romance, C.S. Lewis and Joy Gresham. Yeah. Uh, tell me about these two characters and why they interested you. Well, the, I'll ask you the second question first. The, the script is... Uh, an excellent script. Richard Attenborough, the director, gave it to me one afternoon. Uh, I was watching a, a film being scored that he'd done, uh, the Chaplin film. Gave me the script. He said, "Read it." It was Shadowlands. I read it. It was a knockout, and I realised there was a very powerful emotional part that I hadn't played in years, and I was just hopeful that I would be able to reproduce it because I, I'm always playing these rather uptight guys. Yeah, and this I is a romantic hero. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. I didn't know that much about C.S. Lewis. Anyway, we started the film, and I did a little bit of research on Lewis. I read a biography. What it is basically uh, is about uh, this true story, based on the story of his life. He was a brilliant professor of literature at Magdalen College in Oxford University, and he lived in a very enclosed world. He was big cheese in his university. He was unpopular with some of his friends and. He was envied because he was a successful author. She lived in a rather tight world, you know, safe world. And in comes in his li into his life in the 50s, this was back in the 1950s, comes this remarkable woman, an American, Joy Gresham, and she's like a, a, a force of nature, yeah. very powerful, challenging, boisterous. It starts off, it starts off with a, a correspondence. That's right. From her to him. Yeah. And, and she, she's sort of in a bad marriage. That's and right. She's, she's married got, to an alcoholic in New York, and, yeah. and uh, she come. She is a great fan of his because he's very well known in America. Yes, yeah. as a lecturer. That's right. And writer. And uh, she comes into his life, and uh, she rattles him because she rattles his cage. And he's never met an American woman before, and he's, he's so confused. And things start happening to him. He starts falling in love with her, and he's then in his fifties, and he doesn't know what's happening. What, what, you know what's happening? He's never been in love in his life, and he's lived a very quiet life, and it just begins to devastate him. He's puzzled by what's happening to him. And his friends around him see that this change is going through him and he gets very emotional about it. And he's never expressed emotion. He's a man in control. He's a real control freak. Yeah. And uh, finally he marries her. And he marries her technically because she wants to work for it. All right, that's progression again. It's got progression. And it's all very cut and dried. And then something happens, so I don't want to give the story away, yeah. but something right. very sad begins to happen. And it shakes him up and he realizes that and he wants to marry her properly, and they get married in uh, a religious ceremony. And something devastating happens to her, and uh, he is so overwhelmed, and it affects his faith, because he was a devout Christian. Right. And in the end, there's a great triumph of the spirit. Uh, it's, a, it's a great story, and he was a remarkable man, but his, for me, it was a wonderful part to play, because I have to go through this tremendous emotional upheaval and catharsis, yeah which Stevens in Remains of the Day doesn't go through. Yes. They're both wonderful parts of the uh, Yeah, That's what I'm getting at. You, you're absolutely anticipating where my own head oh. was going, my curiosity, which is good for me. It is that, that the challenge for you was that he's, th this is a man in evolution, yeah. who's clearly in evolution, and who some of the inhibitions are released by love, and he begins to take risk, and he begins to feel, and he begins to, to go through yeah. experiences. Stevens in the Remains of the Day a film that's got an enormous, it's out and it's got an enormously attractive and, and, and laudatory <coughs> reviews, stays in the container, does he not? That's right. He, he can't face his own emotions. He's locked in uh, and uh, chronically inhibited. Uh, he can't face anything. Does that make the challenge of uh, C.S. Lewis harder to play, I mean, easier or harder to play him in contrast to Stevens? Well, it's relative, really, because I, the, both parts are so enjoyable. Uh, um, 
I suppose the Stephen, Stevens was easier for me to play. I suppose the only challenge was the question mark in my own mind when we started on Shadowlands was whether I had the emotional reserve for it because I hadn't used it. For a long time I've been, uh, as my career and my acting techniques have become more minimalist and more economical, which is something I've, I've worked towards or it has been working in me unconsciously. So when I came to Shadowlands I thought, I wonder if I can do this. The big catharsis scene, I thought, I wonder if I'm ready. But I, as we started the film I could feel it. I Fucking progression, this guy's progression. This guy's looking like a finisher. <coughs> feel the power of it inside. It's such a great script. And in fact, what was encouraging for me and for Deborah Winger, who I think is extraordinary in the film, uh, was Attenborough was there, uh, avoiding sentimentality. Richard tends to be a little, he's very full of emotion himself. And uh, he said, let's restrain, let's hold back. And uh, let's not show all this emotion yet until the great catastrophe. Does comes. that mean you shot it in a sense as the film happens? So no. No, you had, so you had to show the emotion and then, and then go backwards and forwards. Yeah. And but once you get the knack of it, uh, once you get the technique of that, all you have to do is attune yourself to the changes, you know, you're filming out of sequence. And uh, Deborah was very anxious to film it in sequence, but yeah. that's impossible, you, you can't, because of the logistics. Yeah. We don't have a clip from Shadowlands, but we do have, this is a, what this is, is in, this is in fact a trailer, and, and we'll take a look at it, and here it is, and we'll see what it says, and so you'll get a chance at home to see the character and the quality of, of what we're talking about. Here it is. Uh, I sat near you watching a, a screening of this film over the weekend. What's it like for you? What emotion do you have when you watch yourself on the screen? What goes through your head? I think, who's that strange looking that fellow? No. Uh, well, on this film and, and on Remains of the Day, um, I, I try to detach myself and uh, yes, I, I stay as detached as possible. But this one is a hard one to take, to watch, because I don't like greatest displays of emotion. Maybe I'm closer to Stevens than I am to this one. But, so I stay detached, but it is, it's, a, it's a hard one to watch this one because it's so emotional and uh, overpowering. What I found about this one, and I, the other night when you were there, I, that's the first time I've really seen it in its finished final version. And I think there's great triumph in it, in the, in the, in the film, in the story. It's a film purely about love and the power of love, the power of life, and actually the need to accept our mortality, because if we don't accept it and deny it and run away from it, it will chew us up anyway, and it's yeah. something we all have to face. And the accepting of it is a freeing experience. A free, yeah, because then you accept it and then you can live life more richly by realizing your limitations, then you're free. Because yeah. there's a line in which she says, I think she says it, or you say it, uh, why give yourself to love if it hurts? Yes. Right? That's true. And yes. he comes to the he comes to the notion that giving himself to love yes is is what? is painful, and he doesn't after after his mother dies when he's the age of nine, he doesn't want to face any more pain. He, so he tries to chloroform himself. He tries to protect himself through his intellect, and yeah. uh, and of and course a closed world yes. of Oxford. And suddenly his ego gets a tremendous battering from this extraordinary woman who comes into his life, upsets him, tears him apart, and he falls in love. Love um, reduces him, tears him apart tears his ego down and suddenly he's naked, you know, and he, he doesn't know how to cope. And then the other, the ultimate thing that happened... This guy's abstract. This guy. And he realizes how powerless he is. And that is the freeing of the spirit, I think. That is the real power of life. And I, uh, when I watched it the other night, I don't want to get too sort of passionate about it. No, I do. I want you to get too But when I saw it the other night... I don't want to get too passionate about it. That's F.I. there. You're trying to keep it in check. The music at the end is devastating. So yeah. And I thought there is, this is about the power of spirit, the power of life. And uh, I think Power of spirit, power of life, he's abstract. The lesson in it, or a message, or yes, a message, I guess, or a lesson, is that we have to pay attention. We better get on with our lives. Life is in session. This is it. It's not and a open ourselves to yeah. it, because... This is not a rehearsal. This is yeah. Been, Life's in session, we have to, have to get on and understand each other and try and live compassionately, I think, and, and passionately and lovingly, because uh, we, you know, it's like that. We have no power to predict anything. Attenborough, as a director, you've worked with him now five times. What does he bring to you as an actor? Vigor, affirmation, love.
Yeah. Uh, he gets knocked by a lot of critics because they say he's insincere. He's the most sincere man I've met. I mean, he's an extraordinary man. He's manipulative. He's a, he's relentless. In what he's way ruthless. manipulative? Well, because he can charm you to do anything. <laughs> to take risks. Yes. To take risks. Oh yes, I yeah. call him the sly old fox. Yeah. But he can charm you into doing anything. But the thing is about him, he's 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 a life force. I mean, he's seventy years of age, and he's got the, he's so youthful. Life force, this guy. Four. Yeah. And he's affectionate with them, and he he treats everyone with courtesy and respect, and that's a that's a rare gift. Let me talk about acting, because you talked a moment there, and you said the notion of being a minimalist. That you had come uh, in in your own career and through Remains of the Day, in a sense, to to view acting as the, what where what worked best for you was to do what to minimize what. You know what I mean? I mean uh, the question is is it was almost like you. He's responding. You were the smaller you could make it, the better it worked for you. But generally, I mean, yes, generally, yeah. I mean, why was this a a why was this a, a, a step for you? Uh, I'm going to hit him for that. I'm going to hit him for responding. I'm going to hit him for responding. Um, yeah. So that means A types are eliminated, and we're almost at progression as well. Um, we're almost doing progression, so that means you'll be a finisher. That means we'll be down to four types, ISTJ, um, ISTP, INTJ, and INFJ, because he is progression. So responding progression already automatically will make him direct as well. Lewis, because of where you had been in Look, terms of acting. It was a return, really, because when I was a younger actor, when I came here to New York in 1974 to do Equus, I mean, I used to sort of eat the furniture, you know, I used yeah. to yeah. figure, when you're young, you can do all that stuff, and uh, I was always a bit impressed by myself, thinking, God, this is good, and people yeah. seemed to like what I was doing and give me part, but there was a great director I worked with, he was a pretty savage director called John Dexter, he's gone now, he's dead, but uh, he used to shout at me to stand still, hold it, and be economist. Be economical. Lawrence Olivia said the same thing when I was working at the Vic. He said, "Economize." He said, "Because you, if you hit the ceiling all the time, yeah. the audience gets dull. They may as well go to the pub and get drunk next door." So he said, "Don't show too much. Just contain, contain." But I never understood that. And as the years have gone by, it's sort of beginning. It, it's happened for me. I understand that the less you show, the less is more. But you have to. The progression again. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Looking like we're dealing with an INJ. Look like we're dealing with an INJ. It's looking like we are dealing with an INJ. You have the power or reserve inside, but the less you show, you let the audience do the work. And it's a trick, I guess, or it's something that came to me. But it's not even a conscious uh, technique of. I just find it easier now to be still. Yeah. And uh, but with with Shadowlands, it was like a return for me. It's like going back and thinking, oh, I can go back to that area of my life. I can go back to this emotional reservoir and use it. It sounds very, very conceited to say this, but you know, I'm an actor and I was just kind of relieved when I, mightily relieved when I found that I was able uh, to tap back into that reserve. But it's just another interpretation, you know. You have a reputation uh, for acting by instinct. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, actually, I, I suppose I'm a method actor. Yeah, but you deny that, don't you? I am a method, that's really. I have my own personal method. Yeah. I have my own personal method that's systematic. He says I'm a method, okay? But what I, I've simplified it now and I, I absorbed it. Simplified the text. it, that's TFI. Systematic again. I sort of absorb the text. Uh, take it in. I, 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 the script the tells script. you what? Well, the script is the script, I mean, the, all the information I need is the lines that have been written by Bill Nicholson or Shakespeare or whoever he is, there. P put it into the computer, which is up here, which we all have, is the computer. Yeah. And... Um, no, he's getting abstract again, that it's not concrete. Let Program it, put it in there, let it cook, let it gestate, and then when you turn up on the set or the stage or wherever you're going to rehearse or do or shoot the film or whatever, relax. That's the most important thing to program yourself is to relax and say, okay, no deep meditation, but say, okay, I'm relaxed. And then come on, and yeah. when they say action, let the part play through you. And I find that that's. Okay, so he just went through his system there, progression as well. For me, the most surprising thing is that the part, the character plays through you. 
through your instrument, your body, your mind, your psyche, and it filters through you and will take its own course. And what I, I what, what the fun I get out of it is the real fun is uh, never knowing which what's going to happen next. And even on stage, if you're repeating performance, you're not quite sure what's going to happen next. And I think that's what you have to do with the other actors: keep it fluid all the time and also fresh. Yeah, it's difficult on stage to do that night after night, but it's something you can aim for. Sometimes it's exhausting because you come to a point you think, I don't think I can find any more interpretations of this. But whether it's Shakespeare or Sophocles or Tennessee Williams or yeah. whatever. Let me go back to Wales. Uh, T.E. Dane dropping there. Was, uh, where, what was your childhood so he was name dropping. like? And, and why was acting, in a sense, an escape for you? Well, I had an idyllic childhood in one way, in one respect. It was a very powerful memory and image of it all. I, I've, I've got almost total recall of impressions and images of it, of summers and beautiful summers. But as a child, academically in school, I was lonely and I was uh, scared. I didn't know. I think perhaps I was dyslexic, maybe. I don't know. I, <laughs> I was really stupid. Yeah. I couldn't keep up with people. So I felt answered. I felt uh, much of an outsider. But you had things you could do. You were a great mimic and things like that. I was a mimic. Yeah. And I was a mimic. And I, was a, I could paint and I could draw and I could play the piano. But I was a bit morbid. I was a bit depressed. My father used to urge me to get out and make friends. And I could never have me. So I think what happened, uh, situations came along. And I, f I was born in the same town as Richard Burton, who was then a big success. The local boy made good. And uh, one day I thought, I want to do that. I'm, that's what I want to be. I just want to do it. As I see that guy, now I know what I want to be. That's N-I-S-E. Escape out of myself and become, so I became an actor. And in a way, I have to say, is uh, it's been uh, a great therapy for me. It's given me a whole freedom. And Talking about freedom, that's pragmatic. Pragmatic people like freedom. I feel that the people like roles to be assigned. Pragmatic people, they enjoy their freedom. It's been a sort of cure, in a way. It's affirmed for me that I wasn't, you know, that, uh, that life is good and that I can actually function and that things are okay. Do you have some sense of what you were born to do? Was I born to do? Yeah. I'm sp still a bit bewildered. I still never, and I'm glad of this, because, when I'm, because of where I came from and what I was as a child, I never, still today, don't quite fit into this profession. I, I feel like I'm visiting. Which, in a way, it's you good sort of for look me. at it. There, there's yeah. some sense that you look at it almost through a telescope, uh, from yeah. a sense of detachment. I still have that feeling, and I, I, I don't hang out with actors much. I feel that I, 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 I I'm actually, I, I sometimes think, I wonder if they're going to find out that I really don't belong in this business. But now. you don't feel that now. anymore, do you? There's a little voice there saying, "Not really," but the the voice that keeps reminding me. I, I guess it centers you and keeps you grounded, which is good. That's good, because if you start believing your own publicity, if you start believing how good you are, and you start living that fantasy, then you can go mad and become a monster. And I think it happened. Uh, progression, abstract. We're done with progression and abstract. Like I said, we're down to I and J. Progression. We already got it. And we got abstract. So he's talking about uh, things outside of the five senses. He's talking about contextual things. Um, philosophies, theories, uh, imagery, um, that type of thing. He's not talking about the what is. So um, we are down to the INJs. Let's go. So that automatically makes him a SENI user, but we already knew that. Okay. Um, but let's go. I think we got an INTJ here. But let's keep going. Enneagrams going to be fucking tough. I, I, I suppose. Yeah. For, for this time round now, in my second surge, or whatever it is, I feel um, very fortunate, very, yeah, very fortunate, because it's like a second chance at it. My life has been a bit like that, and uh, sort of blessed in a yeah. way. What's interesting about your life, uh, to, to know something about it, is that you have been prepared at critical junctures to turn your back on what was obvious. You walked out of Macbeth, right? Yes. You, would, you didn't want to do any more Shakespeare. And you were then being perceived as, you know, one of the next great in a line of great actors coming out of the London stage. Yeah. And you walked away from it. What, why? What was it about? Please respond and look at that. I, I was scared. I was frightened. I was, felt inadequate. I was rebellious. I was angry. I was rebellious. I, I was angry. We got a pragmatic. Let we go. Let's 
go. And the British establishment, as that's how I perceived it. There was nothing, yeah. nobody was, there were, there were no enemies. The enemy was in me, really. What I was, was the enemy, enemy, then? The enemy was in me, that's abstract. What, in what way? I was the trouble. I was discontented, I was neurotic, I was self-destructive and paranoid, like a lot of people like, in no, this Oh, you goddamn INJs in that paranoia. And, but I, I projected it onto other people, it's their fault. So I finally walked out and I, I turned around and bit the hand that fed me. I mean, yeah. Lawrence Olivier helped me a lot, but I turned around. Lawrence Olivier did what? He'd helped me a great deal yeah. and, uh, and people like John Dexter. And, and I walked and I always wanted to come to America and as the years have passed by, I've managed to get back in contact with it, those people and say how sorry I was for my yeah. bad behavior. But it was the best Apologizing thing for your behavior. Um, that's going to be pragmatic because uh, uh, pragmatic people tend to do things and then ask for forgiveness. Um, I feel like people ask uh, before, but pragmatic people will do things and then ask for, for your forgiveness. So that's pragmatic. This guy's an INTJ. Because I had to get out of that environment. I didn't fit in, and I, I didn't fit in. Now I do. I now I can actually. So when you went it. back to the national, to, to the theater in London to do Pravda and That's then right. to do uh, yeah, and all that. Uh, Lear and all of that, you felt comfortable there. Not totally, but I did it as a bet for myself. I thought I had to prove to myself that I still had the nerve to get on stage and do it. And uh, and I went through a little bit of a bumpy time then. That was in recent years. But now I'm beginning to, even that's beginning to iron itself out. And I'd like to go back to the theater maybe in a year or yeah. so and do something. I mean, what's interesting to me is you, when you look at all this, when you went back and it was Pravda, it, it, it was... Um, and now it's a projection uh, yeah. into the future there. In a year from now, I'd like to go back. That's N.I. Uh, you can call it abstract. King Lear. Uh, uh, talking about his next move. Right. And, and you were on the top of the st life in the stage. Yeah. During the day, you're going to the movies. That's right. And you're seeing Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning. Yeah, and you're saying, God, I wish I was in the films. I mean, it's almost like once you get rolling and are at the top, yeah. you begin to say, I need something else. I'm restless. The irony is, the weird irony was, I was sitting watching Mississippi Burning, I thought, and I was doing M. Butterfly. Yeah, in the Butterfly, that's what I was trying to think about. Yeah, yeah that was the one. And yeah. uh, I, I thought, God, oh, I'd love to be in a big movie like that. And that afternoon, I went back to oh, the theater. I would love to be in a big movie like that. That's if I... So I, I always used to hang around. The, yeah. I went back to the theatre and the phone rang. My agent said, I've got a film call, called The Silence of the Lambs. And I thought it was a kiddie's bedtime story, <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. And he sent the script over and uh, Jonathan Demi came to see me and I said, that's it. And uh, that, so that happened and that started the whole new... Yeah. A new cycle. Run for me. A new and the ironic thing is that I'm going to work with Alan Parker on my next film. And, oh, uh, this is what's this? This is a film that you... The Road to Wellville, yes. Yeah, in, in in filming in North Carolina. That's right, yeah. yeah. Now you just finished, what, didn't you just finish something? What, what have you just done other than Shadowlands? Was there another film that I... I did a film called, I played a cowboy. Uh, yeah, that's right, you wrote Cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it filmed in Canada, was it? Yes, in Canada. Yeah. Legends of the Fall with Brad Pitt and Aidan Quinn and Henry yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Good, good. Let me go back to London. The first name dropping Brad Pitt and all this and all that. First time when you come there and you walk on for Sir Lawrence Olivier, you're what? How old are you? 20 something. Uh, tw 26, I 26, think. 26, yeah. And he, uh, it's, what was the, what was the play? Dance? Dance of Death. I went on for him, yes. You went on for him. Yeah, and you were his understudy. Yeah. And you went on for him. And then he later wrote in his memoirs that, I mean, you, he, that it, you were incredible. I mean, there was clearly an actor was of extraordinary, whatever he said, something like, like a, a cat with a mouse, with a mouse in his mouth, is what he said in his memoirs. Uh, did you know that? No, I was so scared. I went on stage that night, I can't remember much about it, and uh, they said, you've got to go on tonight for Sir Lawrence. I said, I can't, I can't. You said, I, I can't. I said, I can't. They said, you go, you're going on. <laughs> this is, and, uh, this I, is why we pay yeah. you. And we were the, built the <laughs> same size, so his, his clothes fitted me. And I, I was terrified, and I, I went on, and it was like I was on automatic pilot. And I got through the show, and uh, I, the audience seemed to respond, and at the end of it, all Robert Stevens and uh, Geraldine McEwen said, that was fantastic. I was like Name dropping, some more T-E-F-I, we're done here. And the audience stood up and gave me a big round of applause. But I, I, I wasn't really there. I, th I, I got through that on some kind of fear motivation. There's one fear, point actually, there we go, let's go. I, had to walk from I thought this was going to be tough, but it, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to roll with Enneagram 6. From this point of the stage, I cross then pour myself a drink. Yeah. And that's the worst thing with the bottle shaking. Yeah. But I was detached. 
from it. And I kept looking at the man in the front row and I thought, I'm going to tell him to go home. I'm going to tell him to go home. This is crazy. But I can't do that. And at the same time, the lines were coming out of my mouth and I was pouring this whiskey and all that. And I looked at Gerald and McHugh and she was uh, looking at me because you... <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. And uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier was in the wings. He came, Even though he was he, sick, he came there. He came out of hospital to see me. To watch. He stood at the back. What did he say after the performance? He phoned me up next morning. He said, I saw you last night. Yeah. I said, you did? What were you doing out of hospital? And he said, well, I saw you. He said, uh, you are very good, baby. Yeah. What influence he said, did he have on you? Oh, tremendously. He was, a, he was one of the most courageous actors I've ever seen. He was a titan, a great actor. Uh, he went through a time when it was unfashionable to like him because he was kind of over the top of the yeah. great... But he was one of the great, great actors of his generation. I mean, a mighty actor. Uh, his style of acting now is, um, oh, well, Henry V and Richard III, yeah. I mean, a colossal actor. I think a real genius. The best. The best. Mm -hmm. He and Gilgood and those two. Yeah. I mean, a real genius, an extraordinary yeah. man. And, and Go ahead. And a, a great man. He, he, he liked the young actors. And uh, he liked strong, he liked physically strong. He'd say, you know, he, because he was, he used to have to go to the gym and build up muscle because he always wanted to play with the big parts. Yeah. And if you were naturally muscular, he'd say, that's good. He said, develop that, you know. Physical. Yeah, and he said, and he had no time for people who did, were lazy, and he'd say, uh, he'd say, stay in training, stay fit. Yeah. And he used to lecture us all. He said, stay fit, you've got to be healthy. If you're not healthy, you're finished. He said, yeah. you've always got to be strong and fit. He well, also, there's the story that he told you, you were a little bit tough on directors. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was during that period of your life in which you were raging. Yeah. And, and he said, what, he's up? What did he tell you? Did he tell you to ease up or...? or he said, you can't go on like this. He said, yeah. well, what, 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 who are you fighting? Yeah. I said, oh, he said, no, he said, you're fighting yourself. He said, and it's a dead end. He said, you can't go on fighting yourself. He said, you'll destroy everything that you've got in your life. He said, you're, you're crazy. And it was then I left the National Theatre and uh, walked away. And a few years later, I met him. We were doing a film together, Bridge Too Far, another yeah, Richard Attenborough well. movie. And I saw him and he said, I hear, I'm glad you're better. He yeah. said, no, and that's the first time they... We shook hands. I'm glad you got through your problems, whatever they were. And then there's a period in which you were drinking a lot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it is. Dull period of my Dull period. What do you call it? Over the dull period? Yeah. It's over and done with now. But yeah, yeah I, I, I got a point. It was over some 10 years ago, wasn't it? I mean, it, you, 18 years now. Yeah. I, uh, and I thought, well, this is, uh, this is a point of no return. This is a dead end, and I better stop. Because I think it's, I'm, yeah. I didn't feel too well, so I stopped. Yeah, but you anyway, almost stopped on, uh, close to your birthday. You, you stopped in the United States. Weren't you here yeah, living in, in Los California, Angeles? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so it was an interesting period. I don't want to go through it again, but I wouldn't have missed it. it was, uh, I've lived two lives, and it was, uh, I had some fun with it as well. Um, but I don't miss it. I have mean, some fun with it, meaning what? That you? Oh, I had some rare old times here in New York. Yeah. Uh, Charlie's done the fully. I had some good. I had some good fun with it. But in the end, it got a little bit kind of irksome. I was a bit of a nuisance. Yeah. I was a You've always liked America. Yeah. What I mean, there's the stories that you can, you know, just get in a car, yeah. and drive is a great passion for you, yes. you know, to soak it up. Well, I was uh, raised uh, during the war years, Second World War. I was born in 1937, and we were uh, towards D-Day. A lot of Americans were in our town and around, and so uh, I always, my, I had the powerful impressions of Americans. And then post-war years, I went up to London on a holiday with my parents, and it was full of Americans. And I liked the, I liked the noise they made. I liked the kind of energy and the. Yeah. And the, the, the green uniforms and the money and the smell of cigars and all that. And I thought they were so romantic. And I was brought up in American movies. And I became obsessed with America from a very early age. My father bought me some encyclopedias. And I, this morning I was having some photographs taken downtown in, in the village. And I used to, and in the background was the Empire State yeah. Building. When I was four or five years of age, I used to look through these photographs of American skyscrapers. And I knew, I knew that the Empire State Building had 102 stories. And I was obsessed. My father said, why, why is he obsessed with all this? Yeah. And I think really it was like a, a, a target in my brain. I wanted to come to America, and it was a dream that came true. And so I feel very at home here. It was a dream that came true, and I, again, we're done here. He's INTJ. We just wanted to keep listening to him. Um, I'm going to go with the standard 6W5 here. Seems to be... I mean, you could flop it around, but SPSX. Or you can call it XSSP. Um, he is fear, so we'll go ahead and so direct. I mean, he's talked about being pragmatic, um, being tough on the directors, walking off set, having a very tough period in his life. 
Um, we was just like done with it being rebellious and stuff. Um, he's name dropping a ton. Um, he knows what he likes. Um, when he gets into like talking about America and stuff like that, so we're gonna hit him for FI there. Um, so with that being said, then we got everything that's systematic. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. So that's gonna be INTJ. Anthony Hopkins is an INTJ. He is not an ISFJ. Um, and he is, we're rocking with six W5. Um, and we're going to rock with SP, S, X. So, self preserving and sexual. Okay, comment below what you thought his type was going to be. Um, that was interesting. I like that guy. I like the character. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's easy to tell the character was a damn INTJ. But he's also an INTJ. So this is my goal in mindset, and we are out.